It was late September of my senior year in high school, and I had received a piece of mail from my school. This piece of mail would ultimately lead me to one of the most life-changing events I have ever experienced. At the beginning of the year, I had applied for my school's annual spring break field trip to Europe. The field trip coincided with the class offered at the school strictly dealing with World War II. The itinerary was a visual lecture on the tragedies, horrors, and heroes that the greatest war was able to produce. The trip was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I never wanted anything more. In order to be selected for the trip, one had to go through a rigorous process to facilitate the school's process of narrowing the field of entrance from over 100 applicants to only 20 students. Grades, behavior, attendance, and teacher recommendations were all reviewed by the faculty to determine the best students for the trip. I had applied at the beginning of the school year and finally received the school's response. Congratulations is all I remember reading before being inundated by an overwhelming sense of accomplishment and happiness. The students selected, several of my best friends among them, were set to embark across the Atlantic during the first week of April, spring break. The feeling one gets as a kid starting the day after Thanksgiving leading up to December 24th had resurfaced months earlier. I applied for my passport, obtained my valuables holder, I bought a new suitcase, I borrowed my brother's digital camera and prepared his memory card for Europe overload. Each step taken towards international travel was like crossing off a December day leading up to Christmas. Finally, the day had arrived that we were set to travel. All of the students met at our high school hours before our flight. From the school, we took a bus to Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, and after rigorous security checks and baggage lines, we left the United States for Charles de Gaulle International in Paris. The 10-hour flight was made light by the company I was able to enjoy. My best friends, Kaysen, Artie, Cody, and Nick, had also been fortunate enough to be selected for the field trip. Unstoppable, featuring Denzel Washington, was our in-flight entertainment. Grilled chicken breast and mashed potatoes made up our wonderful onboard meal. I was able to get some imperative sleep on the plane, as the time difference between Atlanta and Paris meant we had to be ready to start the day when we would normally be ending it. A 6 a.m. landing time from an afternoon departure began our first day abroad. The Eiffel Tower and Mona Lisa, followed by a long drive to northern France, were on the first day's docket. I remember goofing around with my buddies as we twisted and turned through the many hallways and galleries of the Louvre. Our target was the world-renowned Mona Lisa, a staple of history and contemporary art. No cameras allowed and a long line made the viewing of one of the most popular art pieces and arduous task in itself. I did enjoy the painting specifically and all the others I was able to see along the way, and I am glad to be able to say I had seen the Mona Lisa in person. After a sprint through the Louvre that was off to the Eiffel Tower, we didn't have time to ascend to its paramount, but my friends and I were able to take advantage of a wonderful photo opportunity. Next was a long trip to northern France that made our time in Paris very brief. After enjoying some exquisite artwork and architecture, it was off to Normandy. The bus ride to Normandy allowed for all of us who didn't get good rest on the plane ride to finally sleep. The mood of the trip remained jubilant and exciting. Little did I know how much all of that would soon drastically change. We arrived in Aramage, France to spend our first night of the trip. We stayed in the quaint hotel La Marine a few miles away from the beaches of Normandy. The itinerary for the next day entailed visits to the beachheads at the American storm during the largest invasion in world history, Operation Overlord. We awoke on the second day of our trip and prepared to embark upon a short bus ride to the most northern part of France, the beaches of Normandy. We saw St. Mary Glees, a church where an American trooper of the 101st Airborne Division had become entangled in its spires the night before Operation Overlord. The church has a dummy paratrooper hanging from its spires to this day in memorandum of the American soldier that was taunted and eventually killed by the Germans. We also saw the beaches, still littered with German artillery guns that were established to stave off Allied advances. The wreckage brought about by World War II was still evident over 65 years after the fact. Lastly, that day we were graced with the wonderful yet life-alerting chance to walk on official American soil thousands of miles away from home. We had arrived at the American Normandy Cemetery and my life was about to change for the better forever. A trip that had started with so much joy, joking, and excitement quickly turned into a venture of respect and honor. We walked into the cemetery as a group. We were all silent. Twenty adolescent chatterboxes and five chaperones silenced but what lied in front of us. 
Our trip leader whispered to us that we were free to roam the premises over the next hour. To my left were rows and rows of white marble headstones, each commemorating a fallen American hero. 9,387 crosses and stars of David made out of immaculate marble were aligned perfectly. In the middle of all the gravestones was a memorial chapel. To the right from the entrance was the memorial itself, followed by the Garden of the Missing. I roamed past grave after grave, never before being able to grasp the amount of men who gave their lives for my freedom. Row after row, grave after grave, I was finally given a visual representation of only a fraction of the overall sacrifice of the greatest generation's heroism. For the first time in my life, something was defined impeccably with absolute absence of words. Heroism, patriotism, and honor are given new meaning that few will ever know. The cemetery brought about such overwhelming emotion. As my time travels through the many gravestones drew to a close, I ventured into the Garden of the Missing. A semicircular marble wall rested at the bottom of the memorial itself with the inscription of the names of 1,557 American soldiers whose bodies were never found. In bold capital letters read, Here are the recorded names of the Americans who gave their lives in the service of their country and who sleep in unknown graves. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Chills overwhelmed the surface of my skin and tears began to roll in my eyes. Service, a word we take so lightly today, never meant so much. No dictionary can put into words what service means to me after that day. Men were asked to stop their lives and give everything they had in ultimate sacrifice for their beliefs, their country, and their fellow man. The Normandy American Cemetery left me with a new outlook on life and a better respect for red, white, and blue. I no longer take for granted the things that I used to, and I now finally know the definition of service. The rest of my trip was as fun and exciting as I had imagined it would be. I bonded with my best friends as we enjoyed new cultures and new experiences. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity of which I am so fortunate to have taken advantage. Although the trip will last as a great memory, my visit to the cemetery will forever last as a memorial to the sacrifice of so many inscribed and entombed in my head and heart, like on so many pieces of perfectly white marble.